holding up placards outside the funerals of dead American soldiers, celebrating schoolroom massacres. Westboro Baptist Church has been described as the most obnoxious, hate-filled group in America. Megan Phelps Roper was part of that group. She was born into the church. She carried those hate-filled placards from the age of five years old. But as an adult, firing off tweets against online critics, Megan began to doubt. Eventually, she left the church altogether, but she paid a high price. The church was founded by her grandfather. She was shunned by those she loved the most. Can she still really regard the people who taught her to hate, to desire more death, that the world was going to hell as her beloved, wonderful mum and dad. Megan Phelps Roper, welcome to Hard Talk. From the age of five in 1991, you were involved in your family's demonstrations, later taking part in pickets of the funerals of dead soldiers in the United States. Can you just give us a sense of, of what these events meant to you? Describe kind of a typical day of protest for you. We organized our entire lives around this, what, what Westboro calls its picketing ministry. So we saw it as the fulfillment of our duty to love thy neighbor, to go out and warn people uh, of the consequences of their sins. Um, their sins included homosexuality, um, fornication, adultery, divorce and remarriage, idolatry. Um, basically, you know, what, the list of sins was endless. And the, the un understanding that I grew up with was that everyone outside of Westboro was hellbound and that you know, our duty was to go and preach to them. We were offering them a message of life and hope. Like our, our understanding was that this was the only path for people to go to heaven and to avoid the curses of God in this life. So as you, uh, as a child, uh, kind of describe your sense then of, of what it was like. Well, it, it was exciting getting ready for these. Yeah, I mean, we, we again, I, I was very happy because I, I thought we were doing good. I thought what we were doing was, you know, we were the good guys. My understanding was that, you know, we were the good guys. Everyone else was, was going to hell. And, and so, yeah, you're going out and you're standing on the picket line and there's a lot of, I mean, often it was, you know, high energy. Like people coming out and you're, you're discussing these ideas that are, you know, it's it's what life is all about, and so I was I was very happy. You've described in your book how you were a willing participant in the most aggressive anti-gay picketing campaign the country had ever seen. Uh, what sort of response did you elicit from people who you were attempting? to persuade, to convert. Because we, we talked a lot about the hatred of God, you know, people assumed that we were hateful, so they, and they responded to us in kind. So generally, there was a lot of hostility and antagonism. Um, you know, people throwing things, sometimes driving their cars at us, um, yelling, screaming. I mean, so it, it was, like I said, when I said high energy, I mean, it was, it was generally very negative energy. Um, and for us, that was proof of our righteousness because Jesus said, um, blessed are you when men will hate you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my namesake. So for us, that was, Gramps said that we should take it as a badge of honor that people hated us. Gramps, you're the founder of the church, uh, exactly. the Reverend Fred Phelps. Exactly. So my grandfather. The church is almost entirely my extended family. They threw eggs and beer and big plastic bottles filled with urine, you're right. From behind my sign, I watched them approach us to hit and threaten and shove and bellow and spit and grab for our signs, our bodies, our hair. The police rarely seemed to help, but my parents kept us safe. Yeah, and, and that's, we saw, because it was our duty to be out there, I, I never saw it as a, you know, something that my parents weren't putting us in danger, the criminals were putting us in danger. I trusted, obviously, my parents implicitly, as, as we all generally do when we're kids. But looking back on it, your parents weren't keeping you safe, were you? They were exposing you to verbal abuse and they were putting you potentially in harm's way. But for them, you know, they believe that God is with them and requiring this of them. We would be in far more danger if they didn't have us out there um, doing our duty to God. And now do you still believe that to be the case? I, I Obviously, I, I see that, that they were putting us in the path of, of people's hatred. But, you know, every time we would go to one of those protests, especially out of town, um, we contacted the police department. They were actively trying to keep us safe. Um, and I, I do think that the people who were committing crimes are the ones who were actually responsible for that. Um, are you still questioning, even now, your decision to leave? 
No, I mean, it, it was something that I, I thought very, um, I was, it was a very considered decision when I left. Um, and almost immediately I started having experiences that helped me see that these things that I had been taught my entire life were entirely questionable. And, that, and the things that I had taken totally for granted, the, the, the idea that other people were you know, e either evil or delusional, ill-intentioned, almost immediately started meeting incredible people who clearly were trying to live life in the best way that they knew how. So I, 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 I do not question at this point my decision to leave. I'm interested though, you, you used in the course of that answer the term, the people's whose views, our views, the family's views, the church's views were questionable. That's a different well, yes. way to say oh, I wrong. Say, and I right, just want right. to be clear about yes, whether uh, you've... Yes, absolutely. Because you're on a journey in a sense. Yes, so, no, under, understood. When I say questionable, I, I mean, I mean, I have come to believe that they are that they are wrong. Um, I, I believed, I knew when I left, there were certain things that they did that were certainly unbiblical. Um, at this point, I, I mean, I still believe that. I no longer see the Bible as the infallible Word of God, as I once did. Um, and I don't think that Westboro's understanding of the world and how it works, um, I, I have completely rejected that. You describe in the book the closeness of your relationship with your family and your, particularly your immediate family, particularly your mum, Shirley. Yes. And you say you became her right hand, you, you helped to organise, you were working very closely mm -hmm. with her. Even though you've left the church, even though you, you now have no contact, I think, with the family, you've dedicated the book to your parents. Yeah. And people watching and listening to this since you might be surprised, to say the least, by that. Well, what I say in the dedication is I left the church, but never them, and that I never will. Because I, I don't believe that my family is the problem. I believe that bad ideas, they have been persuaded by bad ideas, and that just like I was uh, convinced, persuaded to change my heart and mind, um, that they can also be convinced. Uh, and because again, I, I see them as good people who have been trapped by bad ideas. A, a wonderful father, a, a mother you describe as uh, somebody that couldn't be a greater treach, uh, teacher than you. I'm humbled to be your daughter. You're right. I mean, you, you had it's a happy not, child. Absolutely. I mean, I, obviously there were hard moments, as, as there are for all families. You know, the fact that my family believed um, strongly in physical punishment, as as, as spoken of in the Bible, um, but but. Because I was convinced, I was persuaded of the goodness of those doctrines, um, I was. I was happy. My, my conscience and my actions were in line, and I felt like I was fulfilling a divine purpose. So yeah, I was, I was very happy. I suppose it's more about now what your parents' motives were, and, mm -hmm. and whether it is enough to say of your parents that they're basically good people. Because there comes a point, isn't there, where if good people do bad things, they're not really good people anymore. I understand what you're saying, and and so this is where you know the the um, epigraph of the book, you know, is this line from the Great Gatsby that says, "Reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope," and that is for me that is the a posture of grace. It is the picture of grace. It's the idea of seeing people as being on a journey, and and that there is hope for them to grow and evolve and change and and be better. And I believe that is possible of my family. So. So if you want me to say that my family are, I, I will absolutely say without, without question and without caveat that they do evil things sometimes. And that is extremely painful to look back and, at my own past and know that I was doing evil things, um, cruel things, unmerciful things. Um, there are lots of children still in the Westboro Baptist Church, mm. your um, fellow uh, members of the extended family, never mind others who brought their children as they've joined up. Do you think the authorities, knowing what they know now, should intervene? That is a really, you know, I think specifically in terms of, you know, just because of the, the First Amendment in the United States, um, I don't think they have any standing to intervene when it comes to the doctrines. I do think the physical punishment, so this was something, as I was getting writing the book, there was a part of me that wanted not to write about that. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to, I, ha I feel this sense of wanting to protect my family, as I think, as we all generally do. But it felt important to write about it for a number of reasons. And part of it is because I do want them to be afraid to hurt their children. That was something that, yeah, it was, uh, it was really emotional writing about that. Because, you know, there, as you say, there are a lot of children there. On one particularly explosive morning when I was eight or nine, me and my sister got two beatings each for fighting or for insufficient progress on our piano lessons and they were bad. They were the sort that left big red welts, the kind that would bloom into bruises of blue and purple and black. Uh, you also talk about how your mother was 
beaten so badly by her father, your Gramps, at one point that she was left with uh, lifelong injuries that she still has to deal with today. Um, that's child abuse, isn't it? I, yeah, absolutely. And, and it took me a long time because I, by the, as I grew up, I, I kind of accepted Westboro's um, view of those, those, those beatings. You know, they, they're, and again, they're, I quote in the book all these Bible passages that, that justify those things. Specifically, I mean, even the idea of beating children to the point of bruises, that's in the Bible. The blueness of the wound cleanseth away evil. And I absolutely do believe that is child abuse. Um. What sort of contact have you had with your family since you left, which is what, seven years ago now? Seven years ago, yeah, seven years ago this week. Uh, almost, in, almost nothing. Um, I reach out to them regularly, you know, I, because, you know, when I first left, I, I despaired of ever having them back. And then I, I pretty quickly came to, the, you know, to realize, how dare I not have hope for them, considering my own journey. Like, if I could be persuaded by kind, compassionate strangers, who listened to where I was coming from, considered my perspective, and made, made their case, and helped change my heart and mind. I felt like I owe that to my family. They, they invested, these people who invested so much time and energy and resources and love in me, I, I feel like I owe it to them, and I also feel like I owe it to the people that they target. Because if I can help them moderate their positions and change their minds, then they, they will be hurting far fewer people, I hope. You talk about Twitter, and it's, this is an important part of your story. because it's a huge part of my story. You went on Twitter, uh, at Megan Phelps, um, and that's something why I suppose social media we often associate as, as a, a mechanism for polarising opinion, for encouraging people to express themselves, often in very short but very graphic ways started to open your mind. Can you explain a bit about that process? Absolutely. So, I mean, the, I think the very first change that um, communication on Twitter wrought in me came from the fact that it was so short. So having this very, you know, um, 140 characters, I, I recognized really quickly that the insults that my family threw around casually, uh, and when I got on Twitter, and first there wasn't space for it, and second, when I did insult people, um, I could watch the conversation just completely go off the rails immediately. And I didn't want to have these playground quarrels, I was trying to have theological debates, right? So I, first I stopped insulting people. Um, and then like the, the more important parts were, Twitter became an alternative for, so, uh, source of community for me. Um, you know, Westboro had been my only, you know, these, they were the only people that I trusted, that I could, felt close to in any way. Um, and, and so the fact that there were among, you know, this deluge of hostility, the fact that there were also these very kind uh, people asking questions and trying to, I, I was seeing them parts of their humanity. Um, in a way that I never had um, before. And they were seeing mine. And it enabled these, this conversation that um, eventually led to these, them finding internal inconsistencies in our doctrine. The leader of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, wrote last year, social media companies have created, allowed and enabled extremists to move their message from the margins to the mainstream. Yet your experience of social media is more hopeful and certainly very different. It suggests that it's possible for closed minds not to be necessarily just become more closed, but potentially to open. Absolutely. You know, if I had I visited Twitter in 2016 for the first time, and I was talking to the woman who, what, when I was first on Twitter, um, she was showing me emails that she had written to the other Twitter executives explaining why I wasn't being kicked off the platform. If she had done that, I would not have had these experiences that let me see outside of Westboro's ideology. You know, to, Twitter can be a tool for, for radicalization because you have extremists there trying to recruit people. It's like, why, why aren't we doing things like, it? why aren't we in the mainstream, people with better ideas trying to recruit people? If we try to, you know, p kick people off these platforms, isolate them, all that does is it, it lends them, you know, it pushes them deeper into, these, into this ideology. They're, all they have then is this echo chamber with no way out. It's a big dilemma though, isn't it, for the authorities, or the regulators, the companies themselves, because on the one hand, we're worried about radicalization. We've talked about it in the concept of uh, extreme is, uh, Islamist activity, mm -hmm. but actually, in a sense, you were radicalized through your childhood and you are going through arguably a process of de-radicalization, an ongoing process. You know, I think people talk about Twitter being a cesspool, mm -hmm. for instance, and I, I, my response to that is 
I, I do believe that social media companies, I'm sure that there are things that they can do, but I also think that Twitter is a cesspool because we make it a cesspool. We get to decide how we're going to engage people. We can give in to these, you know, very human impulses to respond, you know, in outrage when we see things that are outrageous, or we can decide there's a human being on the other side of this, and this person has, as this is what people did for me, right? They recognized that I had a lifetime of experiences that led me to that place, and that the way out was not to shame me, but to help me see outside of it, offer better ideas. We've said already that the Westbrook Baptist Church was kind of a, what one would call a wholly owned family business. I mean, it was founded by your grandfather, the mm -hmm. late Fred Phelps, who was its pastor. Among the things he said over the years, was you can't believe the Bible without believing that God hates people. It's pure nonsense to say God loves the sinner and hates the sin. He hates the sin, he hates the sinner. What do you think when you, when you read back and you hear the things he said and apparently believed? No, yeah, he definitely believed them. He believed that the Bible was the literal and infallible word of God and that his understanding of it was unquestionable. That he, you know, he, and he was, you know, he was very smart. He was, you know, trained as a lawyer, um, you know, won all kinds of awards for his civil rights work. So he, he was not a stupid person. And that, I think, led him to this toxic sense of certainty in his own righteousness. Um, when I listen to those ideas, I understand where he's coming from. I, and I can quote you so many of the verses. We spent all, I mean, every single day we were reading the Bible and memorizing these passages. And we would stand out on the picket line and we would quote them to people who also claimed to believe the Bible. And they were shocked but I don't believe the Bible anymore, and it seems such a heartbreaking waste of his you know, time and energy and talents. You don't believe the Bible anymore. Do you believe in God? I do not. Um, there, I, there is so much of my upbringing, though, that I retain. These ideas that I learned from religion, um, ideas like grace and hope and mercy, compassion, the importance of community. There's so much of my upbringing that I retain. You say you... you don't believe in the Bible, you don't believe in God. You quote the Bible quite a lot in, so it's clearly in some ways still a, an inspiration for No, you. it absolutely is. When I say I don't believe the Bible, what I mean is I don't believe in the infallibility of the Bible. There are a lot of things that I find in the Bible that I think are wonderful and they absolutely still guide my life. It's just that I now feel free to discount and discredit the things that I think are wrong. Given you think that this um, uh, self-styled church is wrong, given you think it's distorting uh, religion and faith, isn't it fair to say that this is really extremism masquerading as a religion, subverting the US Constitution, hijacking the constitutional right to religious freedom in order to advance its cause? It, it, it's hard to, so, so for instance, I write in the book also about the Snyder v. Phelps case that went to the US Supreme Court. I, I think This what, is the case in which uh, the father of a dead Marine whose funeral had been picketed yeah. challenged the right of, of Westboro to do that. Yes, uh, and while of course I, I believe and wish that my family would stop doing things like that, that they should not use the freedom that they have been getting, uh, that they have been given as, you know, in the Bible it says, as a cloak of maliciousness. That is what I believe that they're doing there. But I also think that it, the fact that, you know, I think that the justices were right in, the in making the decision that they made, that we have to have an, an open marketplace of ideas, that the importance of open, robust public debate, um, it, it, it has to, it has to be the priority even if it extends to the kinds of scenes that, that people who you used to pick it had to endure, because you must have a very profound and deep sense now of the distress that Absolutely. you caused. Absolutely, and it's something that I, I think about, you know, I think about it frequently. It comes up in, in it, you know, obviously there are a lot of things that trigger those memories, and it is, it is deeply distressing to me, the things that I did, specifically at, at funeral protests. Um, and it's, this has been part of what is, has been the motivation for me to do the work that I've been doing and trying to, to make amends. Callous, unmerciful. Mm -hmm. How I was to so many people who just lost a son or a daughter, I'm ashamed. And it's still really difficult to think about the harm I caused. It's overwhelming sometimes. You, you said those words three years ago. Is it still... Does it still get you in that way? Absolutely. I mean, the, the thing about, you know, talking about what, you know, and my life at Westboro, to talk about that publicly, I, it is constantly putting me in conversation with people that I did real harm to. And it is difficult to face that. But I, I learned this concept shortly after I left the church, this idea of tikkun olam, you know, from, from uh, Judaism, which means to repair the world. The idea that it is incumbent upon human beings to see the brokenness in the world and to do what they can to repair it. So I, I do have to face that regularly 
and it is painful, but I think it's necessary because I'm trying to find a way to repair some of the damage that I did while I was at the church. Should Westbrook Church be shut down, do you think? I don't think that the government has a place to shut that down. I hope I hope that it is it is moral suasion that I think is is what we need to use with people like Westboro to convince them that there are better ways to show them better ways, um, and it's really difficult because obviously Westboro is a very closed system. They have built all the all kinds of barriers, mental, um, cognitive barriers um, to keep people in, with all good intention. Let's not let's this is not a cynical use of like an attempt to abuse uh, authority, you know, to to force people to stay. They they just believe. The, it's, I think it's important to realize too, the vast majority of people in the church were born into the church, mm -hmm. grew up there. Um, so they had these ideas, as you, as you say, beaten into them from the time they were- They, they were indoctrinated. Absolutely. And so, so the answer isn't, if you, I think the answer is to, to make better arguments and to, as people did with me, show me a way out. One day when she grows up, your daughter, Solvi, mm -hmm. who is how old now? She is 13 months. 13 months. Uh, so she's having fun stuff right now. But one day she may come to learn about her family, her wider family. Hopefully. She definitely will. And you will tell her, and you will have to tell her that you were part of what I think has been described by one advocacy group. The Southern Poverty Law Centre is arguably the most obnoxious and rabid hate group in America. What would you say to her? I will tell her everything. You know, obviously not maybe all at once and not when she is tiny, but as she grows older, she's going to have questions and I will answer those questions. Um, you know, all I can do is be honest um, to explain what I think you know, the wonderful parts of my upbringing. Um, I will show her the complexity and the nuance of the situation, but I will also be honest about what, what we did that was so hurtful to so many people in the hopes that she will avoid going down a similar path. Not long before he died, your grandfather um, this man who had spent years kind of proselytizing this message basically of hate, um, he was suffering, I think, from dementia of some kind, came out of the church one day, walked across the road and spoke to the people who'd set up, I think, an LGBT charity opposite the church as a mm -hmm. kind of conf confrontational thing. Uh, what do you know that happened that day? What were you told he said to them? He didn't, it was a different message to the one he usually yeah. propagated. Yeah, so this happened about a year and a half after I left the church, and I was speaking to my brother, who I just discovered had just left the church. Um, my grandfather hadn't been giving sermons for several months, and I, I asked my brother, what, what's going on? What happened? I assumed there was some kind of um, you know, physical ailment or something, and he said uh, that my grandfather had been, um, that he was in hospice, and that he had been voted out of the church. And I asked him why, and he said, the day that he was voted out, he went out onto the front lawn, as you say, and called out to the people running that, the Equality House, as they call it, uh, and said, you're good people. And so he had come, apparently, according to my brother and to other people who have left the church since, um, he came to see the church as cruel and unmerciful. This is the man whose website had said, God hates fags, saying to fags, to mm -hmm. use the... Uh, a kind of crude insult that's used to homosexuals, you're good people, mm -hmm. kind of an epiphany. Does that give you hope for your mum, your dad, for your other family members? It does, you know, and I, I know a lot of people would say it's too little too late, um, but I was, I was shocked in the aftermath of my grandfather's death that so the evening that he passed away, the church was out protesting at a, a concert in Kansas City, and people came out with a banner. <clears throat> to counter protest across the street. You know what the banner said? I'm sorry for your loss. Like that, for me, like the fact that they didn't just turn around and feed back the same hateful, hard message that we delivered, the fact that they could show empathy and compassion to my family um, in that moment um, is shocking and, and so wonderful. It's one of the things that has surprised me so much since I left the church, that people are not what I was taught. And there's, I, I find so much hope in that. Megan Phelps-Roper, thank you for speaking to Hard Talk. Thanks for having me.